Here's another interesting statistic. 17% of youth uh, successfully transition from school to a career in Egypt. And so if you want to move from the Arab Spring to the Arab Summer, that has to change. If these kids don't have opportunity and don't have decent jobs, you are not going to see a pretty situation. If they do, it's going to be extremely productive and you're going to see a democratic society. Another interesting statistic for those of us that work in the region and want to stay awake at night, it's a challenge. 90% of Jordanians, uh, Jordan's population is illiterate and one in three youth is unemployed. It's a challenge. It's uh, it's a youth, it's a huge challenge, but it's one that can be overcome, that is being overcome. Another scary statistic, Morocco, the unemployment rate among recent college grads near 60%. Well, let's talk about Morocco for a minute. Uh, we've been operating in Morocco now for five years. Our programs have been expanding radically. Our board has taken ownership and control and made it their foundation. And uh, we are doing amazing things. The numbers are just ramping up. They double every year. I believe in three years we'll be up to 50,000, 15,000 people. Uh, that's a big number, but when you look at Morocco, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. So, you know, I can understand this audience looking at me and saying, great ideas, but really, what's it all about? And what's the bottom line? And why are you going to have impact? Your numbers aren't big enough to really move the needle. Well, they are, and I'll tell you why and how. One is when we get to a certain point within a country, we create a tipping point. And what happens is that within that country, institutions start to look at us and go, wait a minute, why is this organization getting 85% success and we are at a hypothetically 22%? And so that 22% doesn't look as acceptable as it could or should be. And so we're pushing that tipping point. Uh, one of the things we're doing in Morocco this year, which I think is going to have major impact and move the whole system, is the largest public university in Morocco is King Hassan II. And we are now working with them, giving them some curriculum, giving them methodologies to use so that their placement rate, uh, we believe, we hope, will triple. And so once they start to go out to the world and saying, wait a minute, we've tripled our placement rate and here's how we do it, it's our hope, our expectation, that the other institutions in the region, in the country especially, will do it. And a lot of this is homegrown. Uh, in Morocco also, one of our board members is Omar Chabi. Omar runs the Chabi Group. It's the largest private company in Morocco, started by his father, Meloud, who's become involved with what we're doing and also a supporter. And Omar came to us three years ago and he said, in Morocco, there's not a decent course in salesmanship. He said, we could be bigger and more successful, except we don't know how to sell and we can't compete globally because our people don't know how to sell. And people come in from other countries and I can see they're light years ahead of us. Build us a course. And so we started building the course in Morocco. And it was turning out to be a reasonable course, but it wasn't really the quality that we wanted. And so I, I called up a friend who was the guru at marketing and sales at Harvard Business School. His name is Ben Shapiro, and I said, Ben, I'm sending you this course. We're not thrilled with it. Take a look at it. Tell me what you think. He called me back. He said, we're not thrilled with it either. He said, give us three months, and we'll give you back a Harvard quality course, and poof, we have a Harvard quality course. And we do a lot of that. We get uh, very good advice and courses and curriculum from all over the globe. And one of the things I'm hoping to achieve here is to maybe form some relationships with organizations that can help us get tools to better do what we're doing. Here's another scary one. 42% of Palestinian youth are unemployed. <coughs> and that's uh, if you want to have peace, and if you want to have peace with Israel, that number is not going to allow there to be peace. If you can't get these kids employed, they're not going to have a positive attitude towards life. It will be just like Ireland in the 90s. It's not going to work. But if these kids have a job and a future, have something to lose and something to protect their attitudes towards becoming a mainstream participant in society, I think will change radically. Okay, we see how easy it is to get a job in Yemen. And by the way, Yemen, um, has anybody in this room ever been to Yemen? Just out of curiosity. One, two, 
Okay, okay, real show of hands. It's a wonderful country. Uh, I, I just love being there. The architecture, the people, the fierce tribalism. Uh, it's an amazing country to spend time in. And uh, one of the things that I'm proudest of is in the two and a half years that we've been there, 40% of our graduates are women. And if you've been to Yemen, and obviously a lot of you have, that's not the norm there, <laughs> but we're pushing that envelope. One of the things we've recently got funding is we've gotten funding from the IYF, I'm sorry, the IFC, to create a nursing school in Yemen, in Sana'a. And so one of my dreams for the region is to be able to create world-class nursing and other medical programs so that we can empower millions of women. The good news is we have the funding. The bad news is uh, a lot of people won't go to Yemen right now because of the perceived uh, danger. It's pretty much over and we're hoping to get them back on track. Um, it's all, all, the president is out of the country, the vice president is running it, it's, it's relatively calm now and uh, my staff has been going back and forth and so we're hoping to get the IFC to come back in and to begin the process and with luck we want to create a program and train thousands of Yemeni nurses and quite frankly thousands of nurses regionally. One of the pluses of being in Yemen is it's very inexpensive to do anything. So you can create a nurse, uh, a second BS nursing graduate. We've done some preliminary numbers with uh, one of our board members who happens to own a medical school for literally a third of what we would take to do that in the US, maybe a quarter. And so we're hoping to expand his facility, create a nursing operation, and create nurses that not only will travel in Yemen, but that will be globally sent out. Uh, the Philippines gets, I think, $5 billion of remittances from their, their trained nurses per year. And we want to see the same thing happen in Yemen. And from Yemen, have other countries send their nurses there. That's a hope. OK, uh, here's a little chart that we have showing um, basically what I pointed out before, that the system doesn't work, uh, that it doesn't really address the needs of employers. Uh, I've, met, I've met kids in all the countries and they sit down and they tell me that they've taken five or six courses and they've got sort of training fatigue. They just don't want to take another course because they really don't believe it works. Uh, when we started in Gaza, I remember we had a three month hiatus because nobody wanted to sign up. They didn't believe it was possible to get a job. We finally begged, barred, twisted arms, used relationships, got kids to sign up for the classes. We got 85% success in Gaza, sent the kids mostly off to the Gulf and got them employed at high wages and then within six months we had a waiting list. So once our credibility is built, it makes it much easier for us to recruit. Okay, a little further description of how we work with our direct linkage. I think I've covered that. Uh, oh, this is important, this is real, this is a good one. Um, one of the reasons we have been able to succeed is that we have created key partnerships. And one of the things that may happen here <laughs> is that when I go back to New York, or